Hi everyone, it's Elise from Kid and Cloud at Coloring Classes, and today I'm going to be showing you how to color a simple timber texture and create our fence in our scene here today. This technique works great on all different images anytime you come across some timber and you want to apply just a basic texture. You'll find all the information on the colors I'm using and different brands of pencils in the description below the video box here. Now this technique is actually a preview from our brand new July to August 2021 coloring class project over at kiddingclatter.com. If you'd like to have a look at coloring the full image with me, take a peek on the website. It's always broken down right for absolute beginners, just like we're doing in this tutorial here today. So you don't need any prior class knowledge or any prior coloring knowledge, as we'll start learning all about those art fundamentals and theories to help you feel confident using these techniques on all different projects. If you're already a class member and just looking at this mini tutorial here today, breaking down your classes into smaller goals like this can be a great way to start if you're nervous or only have a limited amount of time. So let's go ahead and jump in. Now when coloring any object, it's important to first keep in mind light source. Now I bring this up at the start of every tutorial because it's the one thing that people don't just know. It's a technique that needs to be learned and it's a foundation that's used in absolutely every single image you color up. Light source is anything that creates light in our scenes and we need it for to be able to actually see our objects. It's what gives an object form. It gives it dimension, it gives it shape. So typically in our classes, we work with what's called ambient lighting. Now ambient lighting is a major source of light in the scene that has a big cone that comes over your entire image. Some videos you may have seen if you've looked at YouTube before, some people will say, well, light's coming from here, so this side's light and this side's dark. So that's more directional lighting. Ambient lighting comes over your all of your image here and the higher points that are raised up end up being illuminated by those light rays as they get hit. The parts that are further down end up darker because they get hit last. So when we look at our image here today, we want to think about what's popping out toward us. Those highest points are going to get hit by those light rays and we call them our highlights. Now, opposite of that, like I talked about before, end up a bit darker, they're called our shadows. Now, in between highlight and shadow, we have what's called our midtone. And midtone is considered the true color of an object because it's neither affected by light or shade. Now, one more thing that we really do want to think about whenever we do our coloring is cast shadow. So let me explain what that is. I'm holding something over my hand here. Now, can you see that shadow that's on my hand? That's my cast shadow. It's a shadow that's cast by an object in front or above onto an object below or behind. And what that's doing is it's showing the distance between these two objects. The closer my objects are, the darker and harder that shadow is. Then the further apart we get, the softer and more dispersed they become. So in order to create levels in your projects and have that sense of dimension, we want to start thinking about cast shadow. So I'll talk about that today as we do our coloring, but try and think about these theories over and again when you do come to color your own images. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in with the coloring here. So we're starting with the little fence. Let's talk about how the light is affecting this. So what we have here is we have our horizontal beams and then we have our vertical beams. Now what I can see by looking at this is that the vertical beams come straight over the top of the horizontal ones because you can see here it cuts straight through. Now, what do we get? when we have something sitting on top, we get that cast shadow. So thinking about what we just talked about, we've got the verticals over the horizontal, so we end up with a nice deep dark shadow just beside it there. And that really helps these vertical palings to look like they're sitting forward of these horizontal ones. So don't be afraid to get in nice and dark in those cast shadow areas. You'll notice that I've got my little texture lines throughout as well. The darker your texture line, the more it's going to look like a deeper crease in the timber. So you can see there I'm holding my two hands together and notice that between my hands it's quite dark. That's because I'm blocking the light. 
So anything that's a crease like that in between that deep um, crease area, it's always going to be darker. Then as I get up higher, it ends up being lighter. So the darker areas here are going to look like indents. The lighter areas will look more raised. We always want a variation of both when we color timber. Now the actual shape of your texture here is totally up to you. You always have that creative license to sort of do what you want. You can stick with more of a linear texture so you can see it's quite straight or I'll grab a pencil here. Just show you on the side. Sometimes you may even see timber depicted as going off and creating grains like this. Now this is more of a crown cut uh, timber. So usually when they cut straight through the tree, you'll get something a bit more like this and even you'll get like those little knots that sort of come through as well. There's no right or wrong way to do this. It's just going to give you a different effect at the end. And we do teach this sort of technique in some of our classes as well. But every time we get the chance to color something in class, I try and look at things a little differently for you. So today we're just going to be sticking with that linear texture. It's nice and subtle and doesn't take too much away from our image. Now the colors that I'm going for here today are kind of like a brown gray, really nice warm gray sort of look. I'm getting really nice and dark with my browns and then I'm coming into more of those uh, washed out sort of grays. We've got like the putty sort of colors here through our highlights. All right, so let's go ahead and just jump in with our coloring. So I'm gonna pop him off to the side. The color I'm gonna start with is espresso. And let's start with adding in those shadows that we talked about. Make sure your pencil is nice and sharp and just come down the side of those vertical palings. Now remember, whatever is behind always has a shadow on it. So I'm adding my shadow to the horizontal palings here. I'm taking my time and I'm working in a small, soft stroke. Pencils is about slow and soft, so you get the most control. If we press down too hard and try and flatten all these little white speckles in the paper, then we lose the control to really layer up our blend. Okay, now I'm just going to come down the side here because I do have, the, you can just see a tiny little edge down the side of the vertical palings there. So we're just going to make that a little bit more prominent and come just softly up the other side as well. And then I add a little bit of shading back in that area. So whenever you do shading, keep in mind it's not just a line, it's shading. So thicken up your line work. It shouldn't be super duper thin. Let's do the same on this side as well for consistency. The artist hasn't actually drawn it in on this side, so I'm just making sure we do have it there. So you can just trace up where it would be and then add some soft shading. Okay, now once you've done that, we can start to add our texture. But I'm actually going to start by just coming along the bottom of these railings here. And even a little bit along the top. So we're basically just defining the shapes. And actually... I did miss one more cast shadow. Do you know what it is? Our little bear is actually has his little arms and legs over the railings. So again, that's why it's always important to look at your image and have a look at what's in front, what's behind, and how do we 
add in all those shadows around that. So because his arms are in front, he's going to have a nice thick car shadow the whole way around them here. And same with his little legs. All right. Now let's go ahead and add that detail in. So I'm going to work on my horizontal lines. So my lines always going with the direction of the timber plank. So you can see here horizontal. So they're horizontal. When I do my vertical panels, my lines will be vertical. I'm doing all different length strokes and you can see they kind of like fit in between each other. So I've come out from here, then I've swapped sides. I'm trying to make sure my strokes don't join up. We want that variation so we can have that texture there. So leave spaces between those strokes and try and do them all different lengths so you do have that breakup. Little flowers also in front. So any of these that are overlapping, you can add your nice cast shadow beneath as well. Okay, coming into the vertical, you can also even apply some color just down the side again to create those shapes so they're nice and clear. And then I'm just doing my strokes. Now these are longer panels, so you have to think about where your strokes are going to go, all different lengths and just layer them in. I like to even come from the top and do a few here. As well, create a little bit more texture. All right, so that's our darkest color done. And you can see just by doing that one color, how we've already created the form of the fence. It's quite clear already what parts are popping out toward us, which are further back, where that texture is going to go. So now we grab light umber. And all I'm going to do here is basically apply straight over what I've just done, but thicken up my lines. So you're starting to fill in the space. You want to make sure you come over your cast shadows as well because they'll always fade out the further away they get from the objects. Now again, I'm still, I've still got pretty light pressure on my pencil. So you don't really need to come in and push down really, really hard. I probably at this point have like a standard writing pressure. It's okay to have little white speckles showing through your coloring. If you ever have this, what that is, it's just the tooth of the paper. So the tooth is the texture of the paper. The way that we layer up our pencil pigment is actually by having some of that tooth left over. The tooth allows us to build the layers up. So we really need to have some of it in order to control our blend. All right, next color that I'm going to be using now is my putty beige. So this is more of like a, definitely a more uh, gray-based brown. 
And with this color, again, I'm just coming over the previous and then extending further out. Now you don't have to color over the whole area. I'm still going over my strokes and blending out, but it's like I'm just leaving these tiny bits of white. Don't worry about how much of the white you leave. Think of it more as like just not coloring over the whole area. So some little parts remain uncolored just because you haven't just come in and really taken your time to blend them out. What this does is it'll increase your contrast between the colors. So having those little pops of white actually makes your colors stand out even more. It makes that light source really stand out. So it can be a great way to add even more depth to your projects. You can see I'm not being very precious about where I add the color as well. It's pretty basic. I'm coming through quickly, a little bit messily. We're coloring timber. It doesn't need to be perfect. A bit of that texture will only help to enhance the effect. Okay, at this point, we've got all of our colors laid down, but it's not super defined. You can see a lot of white speckles, so my tooth of the paper is showing through here. Now, you've got a couple of options. What we can do is we can come through and repeat everything. That's going to help me to just settle down that tooth a little bit more. So I'm actually going to do that now. This is espresso, so I'm literally just starting where I did right at the start, and I'm building up my layers. Now I'm just going quickly and messily here. I'm not worrying about getting this perfect. This is really, really important. I'm not really worrying about the tooth all getting flattened here. What I'm worried about is building up my color depth. So focus on the textures, how rich the color is on the page, because what we'll do is we'll come back shortly and I'll show you an extra tip for flattening. But we have to make sure that the color is where we want it to be before we come in and add this next step. So we're focusing on getting that color nice and rich. We're focusing on getting the detail where we want it. You can add extra strokes if you feel like you didn't have enough the first time around. Light umber is next. And then putty beige. And again, you're just filling out those remaining areas. Don't worry about flattening all the tooth, so I'm not really trying to make my blend perfect here. All right, next step. What I'm going to do here is use my colorless blender pencil. So this is really important pencil to have in your toolbox if you don't have it already. What it essentially is, it's the core of your pencil. So all of the wax or oil fillers and everything, but without the colored pigment. So essentially what this does is it allows you to push around and blend the pigment that's already on the page. Now that's really important because you have to remember it's not going to add color for you. All it's going to do is push flatten what's already there. And that's why we did the second layer of the color because if we just did one, there's not a lot to push around. And when we come in and add this, it can look and feel a bit scratchy and like it's not got that coverage for you. So you need to make sure this is the intensity that you want it before using something like this. 
So once you're happy with that, you can grab your blender and you literally just go over the entire space. And you can see I'm just doing it in the same motion that I did before. So my horizontal strokes, I start from my darkest color and blend out toward my lightest. That keeps it nice and clean as well. If you don't have a blender pencil, you can literally just repeat this again with your colored pencils, but make your strokes a little smaller. Smaller, not harder, is how we flatten tooth down. That's your big, big key. A lot of people will come in oftentimes with more pressure, but that's not the answer. Take your time when you come around the edges. You really want to go over them so you can make them nice and crisp. Generally, when I do timber, I want to use really nice long strokes with my blender pencil because my aim is to still encourage a bit of that texture to shine through. Longer strokes mean that my pencil will skip over some parts of the tooth and it will give it more of a messy appearance. Again, because your blender is just pushing around what's on the page, it's a lot harder to get a really nice smooth blend. So I am selective of where I use this type of pencil. I wouldn't use it for say skin or if I had like clothing folds where I want really precise. Those sort of um, objects I just wouldn't use the blender for because I'd be compromising on that detail and that smoothness. But for things like nature, timbers, textures, it works great to help you even enhance those further. And that is actually my fence all done. One final detail that's always optional is you can even bring back your darkest color, the espresso, and you can even do some little circles where the verticals go over the horizontal to show like the little nails. That's totally up to you. It again adds a little different look, something a bit more rustic as well, but I'll show you what it looks like just there. So that's our pencil done. You can apply this technique to any image at all that you come across. Even think about the way that this was drawn. It was very, very simple. And you can even draw your own fences to your character images just like this as well. So it's really just some vertical lines and horizontal lines. All of that texture we've added in ourselves. So you don't need to have any drawing skill or ability to start adding in details like this in your projects. I hope you've enjoyed this quick lesson on how to color up a fence for your projects. You can try this technique on any image at all and with any color blend as well. Remember though, coloring takes time and practice to learn, so your results may not be instantly the same as mine or anyone else's, but the more you practice, the easier it gets. Even if you don't love the result or you've made a mistake today, this is a lesson to learn from and you've grown. So give yourself a pat on the back for taking that next step. If you'd like to color the rest of the image with me here, you can find the full class over at kidandclouder.com. It's on sale until August the 14th, and you'll receive lifetime access to do this class at your own pace though, so there's never any timelines with our classes. We'll be breaking down the very basics in this class, just like we did this little lesson here today as well. So even if you're a beginner, you can see we go through a lot of the details on not only how to create the marks on the page, but what those art theories and underlying fundamentals are as well. There's never any lock-in contracts or sign-up requirements to do a class too, so you don't have to feel like there's any hurdles to come and jump in and start learning. So I really hope you've enjoyed this mini lesson and can't wait to see you next time. Happy coloring.